friend. Most Muslims, I know many, are great people. Watch this. People. You're listening to the Dean Obadala Show, where comedy people. meets politics and all things in between. And welcome back, Dean Obadala Show. We're live here the day after Super Tuesday, wonderful Wednesday, we'll call it, because you know who's here in studio. My friend, Linda Sarsour, you know her. She's a regular on Mark Thompson show. She's been on my show countless times. Activist, Muslim American community, also for Black Lives Matter. She's one of the co-chair of the, the Women's March, a Bernie Sanders surrogate. And she got a brand new book out. She's going to sign it. I'm going to sell it on eBay. Called <laughs> We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. Just came out. We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. So she's going to be here for the hour. We're going to take some calls. We're going to talk her book. So it's not just a conversation for an hour. We'll talk politics, but we're definitely... Sister Linda said she'll take some calls, so we'll take some calls. So, Matt, please still feel the calls. We'll bring some in, and then we'll talk about the book. In a des- I really want to talk about the book, even though it intersects politics. I want it. It's a great book, and I don't want it to be like, eh, that reminds me of this. I really want to talk about it. So let's talk, though, Super Tuesday. You're a Bernie supporter. You were there in 2016. You're there now. You're out in different states. What was your reaction to the ultimate results we saw now? I mean, I wasn't totally surprised because I was watching the writing on the walls during the weekend. I was actually in Selma, Alabama on Saturday. So I got to see a lot of the presidential candidates um, and just kind of hearing the conversations that was happening. So when he won South Carolina, obviously no one was surprised that he won South Carolina. Sure. But watching Pete Buttigieg and then Amy Klobuchar drop out and then immediately coalesce around him and endorse him. And then, boom, out of nowhere, you know, Beto appears like a magic trick and he just comes out of a hat and he also endorses. So then, you know, for me, me as someone who's involved in politics, like I saw what was happening. Um, it was the moderates and the centrists coming together and saying, everybody drop what you're doing. Let's get behind one ca- one candidate. And because he won pretty big in South Carolina, they saw an opportunity to revive his campaign and make him the front runner. So you were not as surprised as everyone else because we were getting these poll numbers. Look, Texas, last time Hillary beat Bernie badly. This is very, very close. It's just that I thought he would win Minnesota. I thought he was going to keep make one of those southern states much closer. And, of course, he was going to win California, but maybe by a bigger number. So I was more surprised that Texas Biden actually won it than Bernie. I thought Bernie was going to win Texas. Did you think he was? Were you in Texas at all? I was pretty hopeful that he was going to win uh, Texas, but I also am um, very proud that we came in really close. To your point, back in 2016, we got crushed in a place like Texas. So yeah. Texas is um, giving me hope also for the general election. There's a there's a new electorate that's really being electrified there, particularly Latino voters. Um, and in, and then also the same same goes for uh, you know a, a state like California. It's Latino voters, Asian American, Pacific Islanders, a very high con- concentration of Muslim voters also in the state mm-hmm. of California. So I'm proud to see that new newer communities are being embraced in the political process in a way that we weren't before. The question is, are we going to be enough um, to win this nomination? When this year he did great with Latino voters in Nevada, in Texas, California, what was the outreach that increased, do you think, his his support levels in that community? Uh, Bernie has extremely evolved on issues of immigration. He has engaged immigrant rights activists at the highest levels of the movement. I mean, he's been visiting these communities over the course of the last four years since the uh, 2016 election. And the same for the Muslim community. He didn't just drop us in 2016 right, and say, right, well, I no, didn't win right. this election, so I guess I'll see you some other time. Right. He continued to engage us. I continue to be connected to Senator Sanders, and he continued to be a champion of our issues. We could always count on him uh, to speak up and speak out. And obviously his profile rose after he ran in 2016. So the movement was really able to use Senator Sanders on, you know, passing anti-war resolutions on Yemen and getting to kind of hear him come out on, you know, Brett Kavanaugh and some of the other kind of fights that we're having health care and saving the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, we can go on and on. Um, And so I I stuck with Senator Sanders because I continue to see his consistency even beyond his four decades before I was like involved in his campaign, but just watching him kind of organize in the last four, four years since 2016. Next Tuesday, I think, is extremely important day for, for both campaigns. You've got Michigan, Washington State, a lot of delegates. Missouri has a pretty good number of delegates there. Do you think there'll be any change in the strategy going for, for you now and next week from the Sanders campaign? I think the strategy, I mean, Senator Sanders, if you really notice and you really watch him, he doesn't really go on the like on the offense on on other candidates. He Mm -hmm. might point out here and there that, you know, you're this is an issue you weren't good on. Or let me remind you what you said, you know, 20 years ago or 10 years ago. He has been pretty gracious with Senator Warren. Um, So I think right now he has to get on. He has to go on the offense. Like the voters need to know that Senator that that Senator, uh, excuse me, VP Biden has been. 
has a track record of 40 years trying to cut Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. He has a horrible track record, someone who took us and one is one of the people that took us into the war uh, in Iraq. Um, he is the man that not just, you know, voted for the crime bill, he championed the, the crime bill. And now with the folks in movement spaces who are working to end mass incarceration, we can't just act like that never happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so so we're hoping that Senator Sanders just starts just getting more vocal and really hitting Biden on the issues where they do actually uh, not agree with which are many, unfortunately, in this race. Do you think Senator Warren's going to stay in this? I don't know. Not what, that you're pushing her. I'm not su- suggesting at all mm-hmm. that Senator Sanders is trying to push her out. I'm just, objectively, you, you've, you're mm-hmm. a part of politics now. You mm-hmm. follow this firsthand. Absolutely. I think Senator Warren is a wonderful candidate. I agree with her and I align with her on many issues. And I think she's had a really hard time um, this election season. And let's just be real here, uh, Dean. There's a lot of sexism and misogyny. There's no reason why Joe Biden is doing better than Senator Warren. She is articulate. She has the plans. And the fact that she was like, you know, doing worse than Bloomberg, like tells you everything that you need to know about the state of our politics. So I don't know what Senator Warren is going to do, but I do trust her judgment. I think that she is contemplating what her next steps are. If she stays in this race, she must have some sort of plan or strategy. So I'm trusting the lady with the plan got a plan. Um, And, you know, if at any point, she makes the decision to kind of join uh, forces with Bernie. We welcome her to be one of our champions. Today, Bernie Sanders, Senator Sanders had a, a press conference. And I want to play one clip that I thought is very fair point, that he has a unique campaign that he's taking on so many different facets of our establishment. And so it's about a minute long. Let's play, Nina, let's play clip number five, please. Uh, our campaign is unprecedented. Because there has never been a campaign in recent history that has taken on the entire corporate establishment. And I'm talking about Wall Street. And I'm talking about the insurance companies and the drug companies and the fossil fuel industry. That never a campaign in recent history which has taken on the entire political establishment and that is an establishment which is working frantically uh, to try to defeat us. And there's not been a campaign, I think, that has been having to deal with the kind of venom we're seeing from some in the corporate media. This campaign has been compared to the coronavirus on television. We have been described as the Nazi army marching across France. Etc. Etc. The the level of shrillness and panic I saw in the media in going after Senator Sanders in the last week was something I've never, ever seen ever. I, I it was from people who were on the left too. I mean, it wasn't just if it was Tucker Carlson, I wouldn't really care. I'm like, all right, you're going to say your crazy stuff. It was not. Have you ever seen that? And it and can you explain it from, from your point of view? What triggered that? It actually kind of breaks my heart listening to Senator Sanders. Um, People have to understand that Senator Sanders has been in this fight for a really long time. He's one of the hardest working people I have ever seen. Um, If you watch any, if you can, you cannot compare him to any of the other candidates in the ways in which the rallies like three rallies a day, you know, events and canvases and going talking to volunteers and going from one place to the next. And the guy has a type of energy I've never seen in my life. He also has deep convictions that are nowhere there. They are unmatched in this race. And he's right. Dean, like this is not a conspiracy. No, Every, it's not. I saw it everything. Firsthand. Everything that he's saying is absolutely correct. And for the first time in a very long time, we have a candidate that's standing up to pharmaceutical companies, the fossil fuel industry. He's standing up to APAC. He's standing up to kind of the political officials in this nation who really have for a long time what they call the party bosses. And he's standing up to everybody. It's like, you know, in other races, you might have one candidate that wants to stand up against the pharmaceutical company. And then four years later, another cam- candidate comes out and wants to be a champion and get up against the NRA. We have a candidate that's trying to beat them all. Like it's like 17 against one. One. And I'm very proud of this campaign and I'm very proud to have a candidate that has deep convictions. He is unbought and unbossed. And one thing that you can notice about Senator Sanders, you could ve- vehemently disagree with the guy. And sometimes people do. Sometimes I do. That's OK. One thing you cannot call Senator Sanders is a liar. He is a man of integrity, of authenticity. And he just tells it to you like it is. You never have to interpret what Senator Sanders is saying or maybe what he meant to say was 
He just says it. Right. And you just take it for what it is. And that's who he is. And that's the kind of leader I think we need in this country. I'm tired of just same old politics. Um, and I don't know if, if Vice President Biden is going to be able to bring the whole coalition together. He may have a coalition. Senator Sanders has a coalition. The question is, these are two pretty stark coalitions. Yeah. They're pretty far apart. I know. The question is, can we figure out a way to bring those people together? I have people calling before and I was just letting them share their views. And it's very, very clear. Uh, I think, you know, the party unity is so important, ultimately. Whoever our nominee is, when I had on this, the National Press Secretary for Vice President Biden, I said, would you consider having a rally with Senator Sanders, even one now, not when it's over, now about unity? And he's like, well, we're going to unite when this is all over. Because they have that usual one at the end, and everyone's like, oh, God, and they just upset. But if they had one... Early on, because right now, both senators, Senator Sanders today made his, in the press conference, I can play it later, mm. made it very clear it was on policy. And he said nice things about Joe Biden as a person. He said he's a good person. I like him. He's, you know, I don't know if they said friend, but he's a good person, good human being, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you, you've got, you know, Biden, I've not heard any personal attacks against Bernie. So you could have them share the stage if you can split the audience in a way. So no one mm -hmm. boo, tell everyone, don't boo. But maybe maybe it's too too troubling because maybe some people boo and everyone and that's what the media would love. Like, look, they booed Bernie or they booed Biden, and because last night some people said, "Oh, Biden got booed when he's on the screen," and people were going, "Look what Bernie's really about." I'm like, Bernie's saying, I saw him in New Hampshire. I was there. I went to various events. Every speech he made a big point about party unity, and so did other candidates. But he made a big point about. I went to an event. Was only every candidate got seven minutes. Was on. Saturday night before the voting in New Hampshire, this big arena. He was the only one, and I said it when I came back, I played clips, the only one that made it a point for not like 10 seconds, like for a minute, say, we must be united. So he's doing what he can to unify us. He's spoken multiple times about, you know, let's not attack each other. Like, of course, we can have, you know, stark debates on, you know, contrast of what who believes what and how people has taken positions in the past. And it's this poor guy, Dean, no matter what he does, like the media just doesn't give him any grace. Like they can't that you remembered. He said that I bet you the media heard it, too, and they magically forget what senator sanders says show. and and you know bernie sanders does want unity bernie sanders you know what does bernie get out of being president when you really think about it i mean the guy's been in politics for the last 40 years he has a great wife a great family grandkids he has great house you know a nice house in vermont he could just be chilling right now right um he'll be he probably has a great pension you know so he's obviously not in it for the money he is already one of the most well-known senators in america so visibility he don't need that he already wrote two books like i don't know what people think is he what, like is, is, is there some hollywood film that is you know is that the last thing that he needs the larry david film yeah totally and so my thing is like bernie sanders is doing this for us like he believes that this is an opportunity for us to really talk about medicare for all and to push our country towards a progressive policy that's for everyone and when, when the media is going crazy over bernie what you know what i hear as a bernie supporter you're not fighting bernie like Bernie's just one guy. You're fighting Medicare for all. You're fighting health care for all of us. You're fighting young students who have crippling student debt where people are unable to even buy a home or even kind of move forward. You are fighting, you know, legalization of marijuana. You are fighting decarceration and ending cash bail. You are fighting like things that we've been fighting for and building in the progressive left literally for like decades in particular for the last 20 years. And that's what I hear. So I don't hear Bernie's going to be fine. He wins or loses. Obviously, I'm in it to win it, and right. I want him to get that nomination, and I will do everything that I can, and so many other people are still doing everything they can. I literally just do donated another 100 bucks today, <laughs> and I want to like tell Bernie Sanders' campaign, stop sending me emails reminding you how, <laughs> reminding me how much I gave the campaign because I'm like, where did I find that money? Because I'm so compelled. Right. Uh, you know, When he's in these situations, I'm like, okay, all right, got to find that 100 bucks. Here's 100 bucks. Um, so I'm in it, but at the same time, Bernie is not this is not about Bernie right. this is about a movement and work that you've seen us do it's not do. me it's us how's it going What's the not me us it's my, well let me ask you because you are a Democrat you're, you're going to support the nominee it's very clear you know Joe Biden last two debates had good solid debates some really good moments debates before not very good our next debate is March 15th assuming it goes off as scheduled unless something changes what if he goes back to the old Joe Biden? And I'm not saying this, not wishing it. I'm saying because I want to win. I want to beat Donald Trump. Everyone's lined up in the traditional... I, I, I'm trying not to say establishment because people think I mean it in a pejorative, negative way. I'm just saying there is a traditional wing of our Democratic Party and there's you know, a very progressive wing that are progressives first and mm -hmm. Democrats second, I'd have to say. What if Biden does the old Biden? 
What if he's not? What it's, it might be just him and Bernie for two and a half hours. What do we do? I mean, what I'm hoping happens is that the next Super Tuesday, which is March 10th, um, where we have states like Washington and states like Michigan and Wisconsin and others, um, that we stay close. You know, either we become the front runners again right. or we stay close to Biden. Because what's important is exactly what you're saying. March 15th will be two days before the March 17 primary. And, you know, if something happens and, you know, Biden totally gaffs the whole thing, um, I hope that that becomes another moment where people get like, you know, light bulbs go off and they're like, you know, actually, maybe this wasn't a good idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I don't know. And like you said, like, I right now want to win this election. I want to defeat Donald Trump so bad. Me too. But at the same time, the people that support Bernie, which is why you have to figure out how to bring us along, is we don't want to just defeat Donald Trump. That's just that's not our ultimate goal. Uh, it's it's it, it's twofold. We want to defeat Donald Trump and we want to start somewhere else. What does it look like the day after Donald Trump? If you're telling me that what what it looks like after Donald Trump is what it looked like four years ago is that's not enough for a lot of people like a lot I of agree. people who still don't have health care people who still have student debt people who you know want to see a different type of foreign policy that is you know rooted in diplomacy like you know there's a lot of things that we could do we have the potential in this country to do but every four years someone's trying to explain to me about why we have to vote for the lesser of two evils and how I have to be the adult in the room and you know and I'm exhausted I just want to try something different I think no matter what, Bernie's changed the conversation for me and many about health care in that reminding everyone we are the only industrialized nation not to provide health care. And the question is any longer, I think, for it should no longer be, let me put it this way, that uh, should we have health care for all? It's Why don't we? Why are we not good enough? Why is America, we're the greatest nation in the world, but we're not going to treat our citizens like the rest? Then we're not the greatest nation in the world if we're not going to give this basic fundamental service that every other industrialized nation provides. So if Medicare for All is you don't like it for whoever the candidates are, then tell us how else you're going to match every industrialized nation. Why are we lesser of citizens? I actually tweeted this yesterday. I was because I've heard I heard a lot of you know different pundits talking about and continuing to bring up the same thing from 2016 about how we were some idealistic like naive you know base and you know we're all about pie in the sky and I'm like I'm not idealistic. I just want freaking health care. Like you know <laughs> what I mean? Like why is wanting health care for all people like something radical? Like I have some sort of health care right now, and I'll just give you an example. Like last year, my daughter had some sort of um, infection in her eye, so she went to the doctor and they gave her something. Didn't work kind of escalated eventually she needed um these drops it was the tiniest little bottle that i've ever saw in my entire life and when i went to the pharmacy the pharmacist was like your insurance doesn't cover this and it was 565 dollars for a little small bottle wow. of drops in my daughter's eyes uh obviously she's my daughter obviously i want her to get better so i'm gonna figure out right. somehow some way how to find 565 dollars that a lot of americans don't have laying around sure. to pay for extra things so my like the idea that when people think and listen to Senator Sanders, and especially when people say democratic socialist or call him a socialist, if you go to any other part of the world, Dean, literally, just let's go to Europe. They laugh at us. I've been to Europe. They're like, what? In Europe, Bernie Sanders would be like center left. He was right, he's what right. they call social democrat. Right. They laugh at us in America that the American electorate or anybody has the, that it, it just shows how so uninformed we are as the American public when we even think about things like socialism. Bernie Sanders is not a socialist, folks. He wants right. health care. Fire departments are things that we all pay into and we all benefit from. We all go to libraries and take our kids to libraries. Guess what? That too mm -hmm. is would be considered to some people socialism. We all pay into it and all it's a public good and we all benefit from it. Fire hydrants. Like it, it's crazy to believe that anybody in America actually believes that Senator Sanders is a freaking socialist. It's nuts. Apparently my mom, she's on Medicare, she's a Bolshevik because she's on Medicare because that's a socialist. That at its essence it's socialism. It's taking money Social from security. To provide, right, social security and the Republicans go all that socialism just think if we didn't have medicare now which is the most popular federal program if bernie was running goes i want to give medicare be like oh my god what That's are you what a I'm communist saying. yeah absolutely so again we're the only industrialized nation not to provide basic health care from the cradle to the grave and the question is why not we should push and if biden's a nominee and wins I'm going to I'm I'm going to assure everyone here we're all going to push him to make this the next step that's the way it's got to go ultimately and you can debate, debate all day. You have to get rid of private insurance or not. That That's a different discussion. But So let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll take some calls a little bit. Then we're going to talk about your book. How's that? Mm -hmm. So I'm here with Linda Sarsour. We'll take a break. Come back. We'll take your calls about Super Tuesday. 
Why did Biden do better than you think? What do you think? Where are we going from now? 866-997-4748. We're going to keep the short, the, the call short to get a lot of voices. Be right back. Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. This is the Dean Obidala Show, exclusively on Sirius XM's Progress. You never, you never and welcome back, Dean Obidala Show. We're live right here. Wednesday, it's wonderful Wednesday after Super Tuesday in studio. Linda Sarsour, we're here. We're going to talk about her new book. We are not here to be bystanders, but first we'll take some calls. We're going to keep the calls short about Super Tuesday, about what's going on in the country. Let's hear is Leo in Oregon, who claims he likes, he loves Linda. Leo, how are you? Hi, I am great. I love you too, but uh, I love your show, especially today with Linda on there. Linda, you're saying everything that I've been feeling forever and looking to the uh, net, you know, to the TV um, and the media to say, but they just seem totally biased against Bernie. Um, moderate government just sounds too much like mediocre government, and that's what we're shooting for. Is like you said, you know, we're we're not going to be happy with just somebody that's not as crazy as Trump, but not like, you know, as progressive and forward thinking and with big, great ideas as Bernie. No, we want somebody moderate, milk toast, middle of the road, uh, not really, you know, business as usual, not really getting anything done, but not saying that they're going to grab women by the genitals either. You know, mm-hmm. uh, right. I'm not for that. I, I totally agree with you. We, we need to be better. And we are the, the, you know, most successful country in, you know, in the world, we could be so much more successful if we had forward thinkers and not just the uh, thinkers for just the 1% of how we can better their lives and Mm -hmm. make things better for them. Linda, what do you have to say? Listen, I appreciate you, Leo. Hopefully um, it's more than you and me that think the things that we think around the country. And hopefully it goes better for Bernie this Super Tuesday. And I have hope. I, I, we're still in this. We're only down a couple of dozen it's delegates. Close. It's a very close race. And I hope that everybody that has not lost any hope at all. I haven't. We're in it to win it. And, and we want something better. You know why? Because we're worthy. I'm worthy of health care. I'm not begging anybody for any favors. I deserve to have health care. You deserve to have health care. Everybody deserves to have health care. I agree. All right. right. Have you seen the media, though, the way that they've been pretty much it's just like it was four years ago, that they're just like shutting Bernie out. And so how are we going to just de- defeat Bernie? And he's so crazy. It's like, you know, pretty much the the, the take that they're putting, you know, the spin yep. that they're putting on it. I'm, and this is MSNBC. Yeah, listen, that. I'm w- listen, I'm with you, Leo. And Bernie said it best today. We are we have so much forces that we have to kind of go up against. And the best thing that we can do is spend the next few days calling our friends and texting for Bernie and picking up the phone and calling and talking to voters and informing 
informing our friends and family just to go to the polls. Like it's not enough for ha- us to have these conversations. We got to get people to the right. polls. And so hopefully young people are uh, finally realize that their votes do matter and they, they, they get it together and they increase that voter turnout on Tuesday. All right. Thank you, Leo. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the call. And, and just to be clear, the delegates are still doing the math in California. They're going to be almost neck and neck. It really is like starting over now. That about 60% of the delegates are outstanding. It's whoever wins this going forward. And if it keep it close, no one will get to 1991, the number of delegates you mm-hmm. need. Then it goes to the convention. There are four. I mean, right now we're talking about, you know, Biden being up, upwards of around 530 or so um, delegates um, and us really close behind. There are 4,000 delegates out there. That's what I want people to understand. There are 4,000 delegates up for grabs. And we're still early on in this race. I mean, we just went through one Super Tuesday. We have some really important states coming up on March 10th and March 17th. Big states like New York are not Pennsylvania like New York in Pennsylvania are all the way on April 28th like we still got time yeah. folks so you gotta keep I mean listen I support Bernie obviously but wh- whichever candidate you support just get your head in the game and let's also get some unprecedented voter turnout what people have to understand here is this primary election signals f- to for November yeah. And so the opposition is looking to see what type of voter turnout we have. Like, for example, when you look at a state like Texas, yeah, there was, you know, whoever won, won, and everybody can congratulate themselves for that. The question is how many people turned out to the polls, right? Can, are we signaling to the opposition that we are so well organized and so motivational, that regardless of what campaign you're in, that we're actually bringing out people in the droves? And that's the thing. And it can't be just slightly more than 2016. Like, we got to crush it in November, regardless of who the nominee is. Thank God it's not Bloomberg. I, we are so, you know, I I would say on the show a lot of bad things about him. But then I would say at the end, if he's a nominee, going to work for him. Now I don't have to worry about doing that Me anymore. Neither. So I'm uh, much happier about that. Right, let's take another another call. Here is Ashley in Virginia. Hey, Ashley, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Fine. So you're in Virginia. What what did you see last night? Um, I saw a lot of um, African-American voters, um, and I am an African-American woman, so Mm -hmm. I was very happy to see that. Um, However, I did want to comment. I do personally feel sometimes that with Bernie Sanders supporters, um, I don't think that it's a winning argument to um, almost have this condescending tone towards people who simply aren't as um, liberal as you are. I think that Um, For myself as an African-American, I am more of a moderate Democratic voter, and Mm -hmm. I don't like to hear people refer to, you know, myself and others as the establishment or act as if, you know, we simply don't get it. I think that the the problem for me with Bernie Sanders is, is that I do believe that he's an ideologue. I think that it's not enough to um, have forward thinking. I want someone who's an actual doer in Washington. And the numbers are simply against him. You know, he's been the lead sponsor for 422 bills. And out of those, it's it's been like, what, three that he's passed. And then two of them are, you know, naming post offices. So I think that we have to think about things in terms of black voters are more pragmatic, right? Because we we have to be. We've been, um, you know, we've been in this country and we've seen how um, we cannot always hold Um, politicians to their word, Mm -hmm. obviously, and we've seen the history of this country really turn against us. So I feel like a lot of black voters, I'm not a Biden supporter personally, but, you know, my parents are. Mm -hmm. I think that for a lot of black voters, they simply feel that um, pragmatism is the way and that's the the way to beat Trump. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you, um, Ashley, for calling in and and giving that perspective. And I just want to make a couple of clarifications. Um, I absolutely don't believe that your parents are what we consider to be the democratic establishment. And I think that's what the conversation has gotten tense because there isn't that clarification. For us, the establishment means the fossil fuel industry, the pharmaceutical industry, you know, groups that actually have influence and money in politics, includes people who are party officials and have influence over the parties. Your parents' votes mattered. And so they gave their votes to Biden and then Biden won Virginia. And so for me, that's fair and that's welcome. And and to your point about Bernie Sanders, and I think there's a lot of misinformation about uh, Bernie and kind of his track record. You know, Bernie is what they call the amendment king. He has passed more amendments uh, to make bills more progressive in the Senate and Congress than any other person and any other elected official in history. And, you know, you say Biden is a is a doer and people are saying that's pragmatic. You know, Biden is a doer. And you're actually right. 
in some sense, but let me tell you what some of the doing that he has done. He's not just the person who voted for the crime bill. He championed the crime bill, which inflated incarceration all over this country. He's a man who passed a bankruptcy bill that put over 500,000 Americans in bankruptcy. Like These are our people who are being hurt. When we talk about things like canceling student debt, one of the largest groups in America that has student debt are women of color and specifically black women, and that's what the statistics show us. So I'm with you, and I understand particularly older black voters. Look, they've been through a lot and they don't like to take risks and I understand that and I actually respect that which is why I respected and congratulated Senator uh, excuse me Vice President Biden for for winning a state like South Carolina so what I hope doesn't happen in this race is that we don't allow this electoral process to pin us up against each other to say black voters versus Latino voters you know like for example Bernie's doing better with Latino voters we're all in this together and so for me obviously I support Bernie because actually people in politics do like ideologues people who have deep deep, deep convictions about things. And so that moves people, right? And other people are moved by statesmen and people who've been in politics for a long time. And also, we can't ignore that Biden has proximity to President Obama, one of the most integral presidents we've had, who is very well loved amongst the majority of the African-American community. And that really helps Biden. And we have to also see that as part of why he does really well with particular segments of the African-American population. Ashley, any last comment? Any last remark? Um, I, I do, I, I do think, um, that you made a lot of valid points. Um, I respectfully still disagree. Um, I just see things from a very different perspective mm-hmm. when it comes to, um, Bernie Sanders' own track record with African Americans. And I mm-hmm. think that we see that playing out with, um, not just, not just the Southern states, but a lot of the states that Biden did get last night. Mm-hmm. I think that he's done a lot of outreach with Latino voters, yeah. but I do need from him personally to reach out more mm-hmm. to African Americans and to include us in his vision to uplift the uh, working class people in this nation. I appreciate that, Ashley. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it. So l- let's take a break. I want to come back and talk about your book for a little while. And then maybe we'll take some calls as well. But mm-hmm. he's got a brand new book. It's just out. It has to do with activism. Activism and not Bernie anti- activism, not Biden activism. Mm-hmm. Active and changing this country for the better. Fighting for civil rights of all people. It's fundamentally an important book. So we'll come back and chat with Linda Sassore about her new book after this. Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. You're listening to The Dean Obidala Show on Sirius XM's Progress. And welcome back to The Dean Obidala Show. We're live here 
Wednesday, March 4th. In studio with me, Linda Sarsour. You know her, love her, one of the co-chairs of the Women's March. She's got a brand new book out, We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. So we're talking a lot about the 2020 race. You're a surrogate for Sanders. But let's talk about your book, because this book, I've lived through some of the things in your books. I know you. So I'm, so I'm like, <laughs> I remember that. I remember when they said that about her. So it's kind of interesting to see that. And first, just tell us, the, the titles We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders, where I get a sense of what the title's from, but is it an expression that you came up with? Is it something that inspired you or just something you, your, your mantra? So actually I came up with it. Thank you very much. Oh, everyone. very good. Um, actually it came from a speech that I did at CUNY uh, for a commencement graduation. And it was uh, one of the probably worst times of my activism career where I was literally being targeted in a way that I was, it was like every day, every day, every day they were calling on CUNY to cancel me. And I don't know if you remember this Dean, but it was a crazy, it was like the, the, all the like free speech, like crazies came out and actually did a whole rally in front of the CUNY administration building. I'm talking about Milo Yiannopoulos, yep. P- Pamela Geller, Gavin McGinnis, like Robert Spencer, like everybody, like all the alt-right celebrities were there. And it was like a big banner that said cancel Sarsour and it was nuts. And anyway, that was also the time when that, that crime happened. It was like a guy in Portland, Oregon, who was harassing this Muslim girl and her friend. Right. And then three men stepped in and two of the men were killed, mm-hmm. um, stabbed to death. And there was a young man, Micah, who's, who now is still alive, who was a poet, um, who was also injured in that. And that I use that as an example. And I eventually, I did give my commencement speech and CUNY stood their ground with me and, and gave me the platform. Um, and then in that speech, I actually said to people, I said, look, we're not here to be bystanders. And I used those young men as an example of, you know, people who saw something that was happening. It was an injustice watching these two women be harassed and they got up and they went over. And of course, you know, I'm not saying in my book, go like you know put yourself in a dangerous situation but when we see injustice around us we just can't be bystanders and it's not who i am it's not who i've ever been even as a young person and you'll read more about that in my book and so i'm excited at in this political climate it came out on super tuesday as you know i mean to walk into a bookstore an independent bookstore which is i hope where you get your book from or if you walk into a barnes and noble and you see it i mean i went to make i went to see if my publisher was right Right. i went and you know kind of snooped around a couple of barnes and nobles and i was like good job They, they were there excellent they were there and they were very prominently placed, which I was very proud of. But anyway, when I walked in and in this political climate um, to see a book that has a woman in hijab on it and it says we are not here to be bystanders, I think is a very empowering message. It's a book that kind of makes you angry, makes you sad, you know, but also is really inspirational. And it's kind of what we need in this moment. You you talk early in the book about what is your jihad and the speed. And I remember when you gave that Woo! talk. It was at Isna, right? That was at Isna. It was mm-hmm. the year before I was there. I had been there many times. It's not, I wasn't there that year. It came back then, the year after to speak. And people are like, oh, Linda was here last year. I'm like, I remember Linda was here last yeah, year. Everybody remembers that but, year. But what, it's really a case study of the right wing media literally taking things out of context on purpose. They've done it to Congresswoman Omar countless times. And then they take it out of purpose. They define it the way they want. And then they just run with it, like in headlines and stories. And it's not just they're doing that, but it's ginning up really a level of hate by the base that they don't care if you're they don't care if you are an innocent victim in this. Tell people a little bit about what happened so they can see this case study of this right wing machine in action. I was at a, a Muslim convention where literally every single human being that was there was a Muslim. I'm doing a keynote speech. It was right after Donald Trump gets elected. Everyone in our community is demoralized. So you know me. I go in. I'm the protester. Right. I'm the rallier. I'm like, where were the everybody get up? Justice, justice for everyone. You know, and I share a story, um, which is comes from our faith. And I say, um, there was once a man who asked our beloved Prophet Muhammad, what is the best form of jihad or struggle? And look how smart I was. I actually translated the word on the spot. Right. So I did say, what is the best form of jihad or struggle? And our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, responded and said that the best form of jihad or struggle is a word of truth to a tyrannical ruler. That was it. It was over. Perfect, That's all. Actually. Perfect. It's really well done. I've heard it a million times. I go to mosques all over the country. I'm not the first person to ever say it. Next thing you know, go back to New York, wake up in the morning. Every I look at my phone. I'm like, why are these people all texting me, calling me, missed calls? And it was like, are you okay, Sister Linda? Are you safe? Are your kids safe? And I was like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> but of course, in... 2017 at the time, the most natural thing you do is you go to Twitter because if they know, if everybody knows, it must be on Twitter. I go to Twitter. There goes my face at the top of the like trending topics, not just my name, but my face. Then my name is number one. And then Jihad is number two. And then I was like, oh, man, I know exactly what happened. 
And then from there, you know, I'm not going to lie to you, like it was outrageous. I mean, people were calling for me to be arrested for treason. I should be hung and all these kind of crazy things and death threats and all kinds of outrages. And they were mailing stuff. They were calling the Arab American Association office, like harassing That's my staff. That's time. where I was working at the time. And one of the reasons why I left, actually, um, because of the, the, the level of harassment that 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 you know immigrant women who worked there were receiving it was a lot of fear you know sure. they were leaving messages in the inbox and they would come in the morning and th- listen to voicemails outrageous anyway make a long story short you know people in our community dean and you know this they've been through a lot of shit excuse my language sure. and and they kept calling me being like sister linda you got to be careful why don't you put out some sort of reconciliatory statement you know you could apologize you could say to people i'm so sorry for using a word you don't understand <laughs> and that's just not who i am right. and i and i felt sad that our people were so scared so i i had to make a decision and you'll read more about it in my book which is actually how i start my book this is why i mm-hmm. wrote my book by sharing the story is i decided to double down and i said you know look what's worse than what i'm already have what the experience i'm already having i'm ready ready to take one for the team and so um Next thing you know, I got a, a, a op-ed in the Washington Post, and it was called, you know, I'm the Islamoph- Islamophobe's worst nightmare. And I wrote about this experience, but it's just in general. And I doubled down on jihad. And the next thing you know, everybody was jihading, you know, op-eds everywhere. They were in the Huffington Post, the New York Times. They were talking, you know, reporters were talking to scholars. There was a guy at the time who worked at the at BuzzFeed named Chris Geidner, mm-hmm. who actually took my speech and literally right. transcribed. It. And he was like, "Y'all are trash quoting Linda." And when people saw my speech, they were like, "Are you crazy? Is this?" This what the controversy is about because 99% of people were like this is amazing that was probably the most inspirational thing I ever read so anyway my point is is that that was just one experience about how as a Muslim other people are trying to define how I practice and preach my faith and that's not what this country is all about and I'm not going to live my life worrying about something that someone else fears because they don't understand what it actually is and I don't go around telling Christians how to define their faith or how they worship I don't tell that to the Jews I don't tell that to Hindus or Sikhs or and I want people to practice their sure. religions as long as you're not harming or hurting anyone you do you and let the muslims do us and that's kind of the point of my book of just sharing my journey of how i became an activist my family story um and just some of the campaigns that you know that i worked on and what oh it feels gosh, like I know. you know when you get people together and you get up and you organize you win and i've won a lot of times so i'm not a person that's always the underdog like i've had some great wins you know it, it, on that very point you in the book mention intersectionality and Kimberly Crenshaw, like the origins of the term. And I think it's really important for people who don't know, share a little bit about the origins of the term, why Kimberly Crenshaw said it, and then share with why our community is so small. Without intersectionality, we're dead. We're like gone. So (laughs) tell people a little about the origins of that concept. A lot of people use it these these days. It's like they name conferences after it. The white ladies are running around being like intersectionality. And I'm just like, let's be clear where this term came from. And it comes from a a scholar um, and an academia and an activist named Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. And she had a very specific definition. Her The idea of intersectionality is working at the intersections of oppression. The idea that in order for us to fight for racial justice, we also have to fight for gender justice and economic justice and climate justice and, and all the kind of different justices that we, you know, and also like when you look at a woman who's like black, queer, you know, working class, like these are a lot of people hold multiple identities. So you can't just work on and tell her you can only care about reproductive mm-hmm. rights when she's also a black mom, for example, and has to worry about issues of racial justice, criminal justice reform. She has to worry about, you know, living wage and all other housing and all other right. kinds of issues that come about. Um, so for me, and also as a, as a Muslim, as you know, we are one of the most diverse groups in of all faith groups in this country and maybe even in the world. And so for us, intersectionality is already part of who we are as sure. a community. Like we hold multiple identities. Like you and I are Palestinian and Muslim. There are people in our community who are, you know, Southeast Asian or Asian um, Muslims, but also maybe working class and maybe people who are, you know, uh, you know, d- Democrats versus Republicans. Like we hold multiple um, identities as as human beings, people who have, you know, disability in our community. You know, there's all kinds of things, gender identities, all that. So for us, we have to be an intersectional community, not only internally, Mm -hmm. but then we have to be intersectional outside of our community. Because like you said, we are only like 2% of the U.S. population. So if we're thinking that Muslims somehow are going to magically get rights by themselves, like we are mistaken. And so for me, I learned that early on before 
everyone started kind of using intersectionality in the way that we do now, that as a Muslim American, as a Palestinian, like I can't win rights for myself and my family if I'm not working with African-Americans in my community and outside my community, Latino communities, LGBTQ communities, uh, Asian-American, Pacific Islanders, Jews, you know, all people of faiths, atheists. Like, I'm. listen, if you want justice, I don't care who you are. I'm with you. You are my team. I'm on your team. And, and that's so fundamentally important because even in your book, you talk about experiences. In fact, Bloomberg's gone, but we were going to talk about it more. But like your fight for getting in New York City, uh, the IE, the religious mm-hmm. holiday for Muslims, like a day off from school. And Bloomberg, like, nope, not nope. doing it. Like he was very. He just got up and was like, absolutely not. He's like, you know what? Don't waste your time. He's like, just so you know, while I'm the mayor of the city, that is not going to happen. I am not closing schools and just walked out of the room. And then we, we ha- you know, we had no other choice because in New York City, we have a department of education. It's not a school board. So mm-hmm. it's not like in other cities. Basically, the bo- the boss of the department of education is the mayor of New York. He's like the CEO. And so when the CEO says no, there's nowhere else to go. So we literally had to kind of shut our campaign down for like almost two years to wait for a new election to basically pressure some new candidates and eventually the next mayor of New York City. And we ended up obviously winning that campaign. But because of Bloomberg, it took us nine years for the New York City public schools you know, system to recognize one that one out of every eight students in New York City public schools are Muslim. That's 13 percent of the New York City public school population. So we're not talking about just a few children. We're talking about tons of kids, especially, you know, in places like Queens. Almost entire schools are empty on aid because they are in Jackson Heights, you know, in some parts of Southeast Queens in Bay Ridge in you know, in Kensington and a lot of places where we are highly concentrated. The principals were with us. We had the principals union. The UFT was with us because they even saw what we were saying. Right. And they were like, yeah, we're with them. So they endorsed our campaign. So eventually we won. And, and no I thanks had, to Bloomberg. I had Mayor de Blasio on last night. We were talking about Bloomberg before Bloomberg dropped out. And, and that actually came up as well. The Bloomberg was opposed to the holiday, the, having the IE as a school holiday for kids. You worked on stop and frisk as well. I mean, talk about intersectionality. While there are a component of our community who is black and mm-hmm. brown, um, it's not an issue known for our community. But you were out there doing the work. Absolutely. I mean, for me, as someone who is fighting the New York Police Department on another racist policy, which is the unwarranted surveillance mm-hmm. of our community that literally impacted almost one million New Yorkers, which is why I didn't want Bloomberg to to be the, the president or have a shot at the presidency, because running two racist policies that literally violated the civil liberties of millions of New Yorkers, what makes you think that you're safe if you live in another city somewhere else just because it happened, quote unquote, in New York under a Bloomberg administration? And so for me, I saw the intersections of that. It was right. one police department engaging in racial and religious profiling. So what was the point of me going being on one street corner saying, you know, stop spying and then have and having my black and brown sisters and brothers on another street corner talking about, you know, stop stopping and frisking us, you know. So the idea was bring us all together. And when we came together as you will read in my book, we beat Bloomberg. Right. So that was actually a campaign that we won under the Bloomberg administration. We had a, 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 a landmark piece of legislation that he vetoed, in fact. Not only did he veto us, he went and funded candidates in the city council to run against our candidates who voted with us to try to intimidate them into changing their votes on the second time around because we had another opportunity. Mm-hmm. And he put all his money, as you know, because that's all, that's all he knows how to do. Right. And we went back one night. It was the summer. It was hot. It was like 12 to 1 o'clock in the morning, and we passed the Community Safety Act, bigger than we passed it the first time, and it became veto-proof majority, and we beat Bloomberg and all his money. To sum up, Bloomberg is a not a good guy. Let's be blunt, folks. And I'm glad that he's out of the race now, and I'm glad he's going to support whoever our nominee is. I don't know if Bernie's nominee, if he will, to be blunt. but I don't know. Right. But you know, I, I'm glad he's out of the race. I didn't have to deal with that issue. Mm-hmm. So let's take a quick break. We're going to come back, find out what Linda Sarsour's next jihad is. Uh-oh. Uh, no, no. We're talking a little bit. But I want to talk about, about, you know, you have death threats at you, but you've got a family. And mm. that concerns you more, obviously. We all feel we're impervious, or if something happens to us, so be it. Mm. But it's the kids and the family. And near the end of the book, you talk about the FBI coming to tell you about something. So when we come back, we'll talk to Linda Sarsour about that. And her, and her great new book, We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. Be right back. Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127.
Dean Ovidala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. Conspiracy to take over the demo. And welcome back. We're here with our friend Linda Sarsour. Oh my gosh. So Linda Sarsour, in her book near the end, talks about the FBI coming to visit her. And, you know, we talk about the concerns each of us have for ourselves is one thing, but when it gets the family and loved ones, it gets elevated, of course. So tell us, Linda, and it's laid out in your book, but give us, share a little bit about that when the FBI came to and what was going on. Uh, it was actually, um, I don't know if you remember about over about a year ago, maybe less than a year ago now, what am I talking about? I don't even remember anymore, but it was, um, right after the horrific shooting that happened at the Pittsburgh synagogue Mm -hmm. when, when a white supremacist went in and killed 11 innocent people. The day before that, there was another news story of a, of a man in Broward County, Florida, that was like mailing pipe bombs to the homes of really notable people that he believed to be in opposition to Donald Trump. Um, and eventually he gets arrested. So to make the story clear, and then the synagogue shooting happens and that's the next really big story and it's all horrifying and then on Monday I'm home all of a sudden it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon broad daylight outside I get a knock on my door I look outside it's like two white guys wearing like flannel shirts little puff jackets and sneakers and you know anybody else when you think of FBI agents you think at least they're wearing a suit and some lanyard like on on their neck yeah on TV exactly and and actually in the past when I've met seen FBI agents at these big like you know events or whatever like that's what they look like and so I got really concerned I looked back out the window and I saw like these construction workers from Con Edison and I was like really would these guys really do something crazy with all these witnesses you know let me take a chance I opened the door I had a friend on the phone who I left on speakerphone to hear the conversation and I said how can I help you they said are you Linda Sarsour I was like who are you (laughs) and they were like we are the New York State FBI and at that moment of course I I, I verified they were FBI agents and I said to them I'm not going to speak to you without my lawyer and they saw some concern I was concerned and to be honest with you and you know this as as a Muslim I mean as a Muslim political activist all the I felt like hyperventilating I was like I had this you know conspiracy in my mind I was like I bet you the Islamophobes concocted something and somehow I'm involved in some you know something even though I know I'm a thousand percent innocent all these thoughts went through my mind and I think the FBI agent knew I was concerned and he looked at me and said listen just want you to know we are not here to investigate you or anybody that you know and and I'm telling you right now he could have told me anything else it was like Whew, all right. That's all. And so then finally I was like, okay, so why are you here? And so he said, we just came to inform you. We got directive from our national FBI office that the home of this man named Caesar Sayak was the raided Magabama. and his van and they had, they found addresses for you, you know, and things like that. And I was like, Okay. And that was it. And that was the conversation. Like, I don't know what am I supposed to say after that? Um, You know, obviously, as you know, I'm a regular person like everybody else. No one intercepts my mail. My kids are always ordering things off of Amazon, you know. Anyway, the minute I walked in um, my house, I just leaned up against the, the back of the door. And it was so crazy at that moment. I was so relieved to know that you weren't it wasn't an investigation that you were friends you're like oh, just no, the I, bomber just wants to kill me yeah yeah literally i was like this i was like thank god i'm not an on i, I was like almost like thank god i'm not an on an fbi investigation list but on an actual assassination list like that made me like that was like i was I had so much relief and i just ran back up to my apartment linda but, we got, we're running out of time again the book it's a great book i love it folks check it out we are not here to be bystanders it's a story linda so sure it's part activism part memoir it's a roadmap to get out there and make change linda it's great seeing you. Thank you. Congratulations on the book. I hope yes. it goes to number one. I hope so. It's where all books are sold. You can get it on any website, Barnes and Noble, your independent bookstore. Just go get it. Check it out, folks. Folks, we'll be right back with more of the Dino Bidala show right after this.